Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Channel 781 News Debrief. Uh, we took a, we've taken a uh, month-long hiatus. This is the first uh, debrief back. Uh, we apologize for that. We took the first week off. We didn't feel like there was enough we talked about, and then we had an event to go to uh, at the next one. And then uh, more than a majority of the people that are on the show are Jewish, and we lost all that time with Passover. And so we apologize for all of that. Um, and we are back chatting about the Waltham City Council and other related things. Um, so this week, uh, touching on some of the things we missed out on, we're going to be talking about um, an affordable housing resolution that went to ordinance and rules uh, that did not go the way uh, supporters of, of Watch CDC would have liked to seen it go. Uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the Fitch and the future of that building, along with Healthy Waltham. Um, we're going to talk about the Conservation Committee and the Fernal property uh, and a couple other small things. Um, so uh, joining us today is Joss Castor. Hello, everyone. And James R. Kelly's. Hi, everyone. And so James, uh, speaking up, is going to uh, chat a little bit about the affordable housing resolution that went to ordinance and rules because uh, he was in attendance at that. Uh so, uh, yeah, I was uh, in attendance and I stuck around to be in support for the while well, they're in the uh, rules and ordinances. And uh, there's, I mean, they, 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 they pretty packed the chamber in their own right. I mean, basically as much as any other of the other events recently this year. And what was also interesting was that they, like some of the events, they ended up at, you could tell that they were going to be, you know, you know, that, that, the, like in some of the events that happened earlier this year, they had cops in, and you know that sort of sets the tone for things. Uh, in I don't I don't recall seeing nearly as many uh, that kind of presence when it was the uh, some of the other like packed uh, rooms. Uh, in, any, in any case, uh, the there was some some back and forth, and we can get into that in, in a bit. But uh, James, the, what is the resolution? Oh yeah, the, oh, oh god, yeah. Yeah, uh, the resolution is just to make uh, tenant, tenants aware of their rights, uh, yeah. and and to basically make an ordinance for that, and to to if they'll have to. One second, like my cat is. This is <laughs> for the people that only listen to our show like a podcast. You often miss out on James's cat. Just, I, just I, yeah. on the screen. So th this is a uh, tenants' rights ordinance. So just it, it's to make could make an ordinance that they have to uh, that landlords would have to notify new tenants of their rights and this yeah they is... get they get a packet when they sign their lease of all of their rights because watch cdc um probably the biggest uh proponent of uh tenant rights in our city um often hear stories uh from tenants that they didn't know all of their rights and often you know they fall through the cracks they lose their housing they get evicted um and, and a lot of people are like well why didn't you just do x y and z but the problem is they don't know that x y and z is an option and and the city has like used like funds to pay out like to, to pay out rents and stuff so like this they what watch helps connect people to stuff like that so mm -hmm. this is just making it more standardized that everyone knows where they can get help for stuff like this rather than having it get to the point of having an eviction happen yeah so watch cdc asked folks to come to that meeting um in, in a show of support because it had been tabled for over a year yeah yeah and so there was um and so they were in the Hoover room, which is the room next to the city council uh, chamber. And so it's a smaller room. And so the, the, the room was completely packed with supporters, with signs and everything. And so um, and this is where I'm actually going to backtrack a little bit. Um, at the beginning of this city council uh, session, um, we were talking about the um, the assignments, the committee assignments, who was sitting on what committee. And I said something that's not entirely true. I want to I want to point out a mistake. I said I said that most of what the committee assignments is about is just getting a vibe for the city because any councilor can speak on any matter um, in the city council. All you need is a vote uh, to hear from our committee members, uh, and 
it's it's like 99 percent uh, of the time you're going to be allowed to speak on a matter if you're a city councilor and uh, you're not sitting on the committee. And I said I said there wasn't that many advantages to being on the committee. Um, but as soon as I said it, I, I went I went to bed and I was like, I can think of a few instances where or where that's that's the case. And um, and so uh, this particular meeting is one of those um, that shows that because for anything to be taken off the table, all new items need to be talked about. And so you don't need a vote to take them off the table. Um, but anything that's sitting on the table uh, in the docket um, needs to be voted. It needs a city councilor to take it off the table. And so you do, so if you're watch CDC, this is a very good example. Um, if you're watch CDC, you need um, someone sitting on the ordinance and rules committee to take that off the table. You can email the whole committee and say, please take this off the table. But if they're organized around an issue and they don't like it, or if, you know, they just want to be a dick, they, they don't have to respond to you. They don't have to. Um, and so it's not like, I think I got that wrong when I said that. I think there's plenty of instances where uh, being on a committee is important. Um, and so I'd like to, I'd like to make that um, admission of a mistake. Um, and so, but they thankfully, they at least got that far. They did get it taken off the table, and they did, uh, uh, you know, and what, Jay, do you want to talk about this linearly, like what happened? So, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut to at least one, one part, which was the, um, that, the sticking point that Kathy Ann was, was had the, was when uh, they wanted to ask a representative from Watch, and that was rather much better. It was all going sort of according to script, where they had an off-committee member pause, speak about this issue, and he kind of went headed back and forth with Kathy Ann uh, for a bit. And in that back and forth, Kathy Ann had mentioned that uh, there wasn't support for this on committee, which jumped out at me. Um, and we can play the clip for that here. Yeah, this is a clip uh, where Watch CDC wanted one of their representatives to give a statement. Uh, Jonathan Paz, the one nine city councilor, is asking for that to happen. And uh, this is Kathy Ann Harris saying no. It's coming from you've presented to one committee of five and a committee tonight of four. And I want to thank everybody for coming in tonight. Um, all of your voices should be heard. That is the most important part of public process and representation. Uh, experts here, which are watch, to speak right. out on the matter. Right, Councillor. That's all. Yeah, Councillor, I, I have to work across the committee, and there's not support for that on the committee. You're hearing people say it. You had Jonathan Paz uh, there. He got to speak on it. And uh, through that, uh, Kathy Ann Harris, uh, the chair of the Ordinance and Rules Committee, did say that in one month, they were going to talk about it. They wanted to give everyone time to read uh, read all the documents and all that stuff. Uh, but they there was not support on the committee to hear from uh, those people, um, the tenants uh, and the watch representative. Um, and so, you know, again, this is all just about politics. If maybe if you had never watched one of these meetings and you want and you were there, maybe if you were in attendance, maybe. You heard Kathy Ann's words, and it's I guess, and you thought it was fine. Maybe you thought, oh well, uh, yeah, there's not support on it from the committee. There must be the we probably can't talk about it because there's not support on it from the committee. But I mean, for the people that have been paying attention to these things, people that, that watch these meetings, it just it just kind of made her look really bad because there has been plenty of instances. Um, let's let's, talk, let's break this out into two parts. There have been plenty of instances where. Someone wants to take something off the table that's that hasn't that hasn't been taken off in a year or more. There's plenty of things that have been on there for many years. Uh, there's plenty of instances where that's being talked about. Um, and if and if anybody says like you know can we table this uh, while while we figure out uh, while we give everyone a chance to read up on it. Um, there have been plenty of instances where people get called out for not doing their due diligence. It's been on the committee docket for a year. You should you should know uh, what we're talking about at this point. And so for her to, to pause on it for a month uh, to give people the opportunity to read up on it, it's just it's just it just furthers her agenda. It's just part of her agenda. Yep. 
I mean, yeah. one thing too that was kind of interesting was that she seemed to very very certain that this wasn't a public meeting but it is a public meeting yeah and this is not a public meeting there's no advertisement here no one is aware of this other than the advocacy that's been driven to date and yeah and and that, that was for, a very odd thing for her to press as a point because it was just verifiably not true like yeah you, no, could say, you could say that it wasn't advertised as a public input session but it's still a public meeting and they can take that input well, um yeah a million percent there's no, it's silly what it's silly to even suggest that you need a public input session for affordable housing uh because it's a, well it's an who, arbitrary distinction being made like for this specific thing yeah like they would never do that if it was some other no. thing that they and cared about no, it's it's honestly it's like it's irresponsible of them because she's suggesting that it's about a broader term. But this it's the ordinance is about tenant rights. It's about those things. And so the representatives of watch the those tenants, this is incredibly relevant to that specific ordinance change. And so for them to not for them to say that, oh yeah, just have a public input session, you know, uh, people listen to it. That's just well, 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 they said it was worse than that because they said that there's not support for it on a committee. So what yeah. you have to do is have a public input session where we can hear from all voices. Yeah. And from and then like, you know, we'll see what happens if, you know, you've got 90 percent support of something, but then the landlords say the other way. So, yeah, I don't think so. Um, and so we'll see what happens in a month. Do you think they're going to do a public input session? Uh, probably. Really? I think, gonna, oh, I, think so I, think, I think they're going to try to get try, try to follow the steps that need to get done and as laid out, and that's the next one. That would be in keeping with Councillor Paz's usual strategy to do err on the side of more public input. So I would I could see him doing it to get the support out there in the open, even if he doesn't know how it's going to affect the decision, because that's what he did with Moody Street. And it feels like it's going to be totally stonewalled. Uh, he might, yeah, I can see him just but I can do that. At the very least, it's getting them on the record for that. Yeah. Um, we see you, we hear you, and I think the best thing to do is to schedule before 15 members of this body and the and the, the um, all of the city that we get. So that was a disappointing thing that happened during the ordinance and rules while we were on our month-long hiatus. Um, Oh, uh, James, you want to talk about a short anecdote about um, Randy LeBlanc and that committee? Oh, yeah. So it'd been, I was in attendance for the for that. And uh, I believe Randy was present for the entire um, committee of the whole, but then uh, for ordinance and rules right after with the room full of angry tenants opted not to do to pull put forward the bike resolution. So I, I don't I don't know why he wasn't there, but that, that was that, that struck me as a little ironic. Just that he was not in attendance to get uh, eyeballed we, by a bunch of tenants. We should put up, a room, about... put, up, put up a picture of the room. Yeah. Here. Um, and uh, for those watching at home, what is the bike resolution? Uh, this was a, 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 actually I don't have the text. Oh, yeah, you're, you're asking you're asking me to pull up the uh, the the wording. I I can I can I can I can remember it off the top of my head. Uh, so Randy LeBlanc introduced a resolution that was co-signed by many, many counselors. No one else spoke on it, um, uh, saying that because Moody Street has been shut down, and I think he's anticipating it being shut down again, um, and uh, because during those instances, there have been a couple of occurrences of children terrorizing Moody Street. Um, these are the words of people online um, with their bikes uh, that he would like to work with the police department and other bodies to preserve the safety of people from bicycles during a pedestrianized movie street. Does that sound about accurate, Dane? Yes, that sounds about right. So yeah, no one else spoke on it. Um, and I didn't. I don't think it was talked about at this most recent ordinance and rules, was it? Or is it public works and public safety? I think this is just it getting introduced. No, no. There's already been. It's already. It's already been onto a committee. Oh, um, sorry. Because that was that was through two weeks ago. I made the mistake um, of loading a clip on the other screen. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyway. So. Um. So that is that's a thing that's being talked about. Uh, 
you know, my knee jerk reaction was, of course, you know, I don't want that to happen. I want to ride my bike on Moody Street when it's shut down. Uh, but there has been some back and forth in the bike pedestrian community over whether this is a good idea or bad idea and whether the people that are in this pedestrian at Moody Street should not have to think about, you know, are you concerned about walking in the middle of the street because a bike might take you out? Um, I mean, and that's so, been, and, that's, and, um, that's been like a feature, I think, in like the last public inputs for the Moody Street thing was like people saying that like that, that they didn't appreciate having like police patrolling and stuff like that because they felt like that cut, cut down on it. Yeah, yeah. This is like, which is, I think, where this would be di directed. Yeah, it, when it became a thing. And um, in places, in places that have like a, a perpetual. Um, pedestrianized street there have been instances i, I looked uh where where no wheeled uh apparatuses are allowed at all so there's there's definitely uh precedent set for people that uh pedestrianized spaces being cut off to bikes as well um so is it the it biggest would... deal in the world if it happened i would i mean I, it is what it is uh but It'll be interesting to see. And it'll be interesting to see if there's any racist dog whistles that are brought up during this conversation. Um, and because an instance literally in the resolution or, or no, 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 I think it might have been Waltham Channel reporting on it. They actually had, they actually talked about, uh, oh, there was an instance where uh, police had to be called and a prominent businessman had to intervene. I thought that was so funny because I was actually at that occurring thing. And I'm actually not going to call this person out by name because I actually really uh, respect this guy. Um, and so I was incredibly disappointed. So uh, let me set the stage. Uh, I, was, I was having dinner at Bistro 71 and I actually noticed that there were a lot of like wealthy people at that thing and, uh, as well as this businessman. I was like, wow, there's a lot of wealthy people here right now. Um, and uh, and when I got there, it was the thing was already happening. There were kids and there were police and there were old people talking. And, and I don't know. I didn't think it was that big a deal. It seemed like just people having a, having a moment. Um, and then and then it grew. The crowd grew larger and larger. And I was like, wow, that's kind of weird. And then and then when it happened, and then you know, I'm getting up to leave. And then this this prominent businessman comes over and says hi to me. And I'm expecting this person who really has a lot of social justice background and who's really, I've, I, I've always respected as, you know, a businessman that also has social justice uh, um, in them. Um, I was really expecting them to say something poignant or, uh, uh, you know, insightful. And he walks up to me and he says, I can't believe they didn't arrest those assholes. And I was like, that's such a weird take. Why would you just arrest a bunch of kids? And they were just they were just being kids. It's so funny. All, you know, we talk about kids not being able to play outdoors anymore. But once the kids want to play outdoors, they're like, well, we should restrict them playing outdoors. We shouldn't let them play outdoors. Um, and so uh, I was disappointed in that businessman. If you listen to this, uh, I hope you reconsider your thoughts on policing uh, in Moody Street. Um, but uh that might happen. Maybe there'll be no more bikes in the pedestrian moon street and I can go either way. It, it, it's, it's really fascinating that they can conceive of having a one way for cars as like a more like something that makes sense more than just having like a, you know, a bicycle path down the middle or something. Mm. Like. Um, and moving on to the pitch. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, so the Fitch, uh, which is off of Crescent Street, an abandoned school that's been unused for like 25 years in front of Berlundi, I think I think that's uh, the word. Um, it's uh, going, it's been talked about what the hell is, what the hell is going on with the pitch? Is it going to become a rec center? Is it become, is it going to be bought out by a uh, business? Um, is it going to, it's been talked about what is going to happen with the pitch? And so, um, it was in the city council again, it was being transferred to the care custody and control of the recreation department. And from the sounds of it, it sounds like the, the gym, which if you ever looked at the building, it's like, it's like, it's like a square, um, is going to be preserved. Um, and then the rest of that building is going to be torn down. Um, and it sounds like it's going to become a park. And of course, this this might not be true, but just from the conversations that were happening, it sounds like there's going to be green space, um, and then that the build the the um, the gym is going to be turned into something else. Um, 
it could uh, it could be many things. I, it, the last I heard, it was going to be a, a recreation uh, center, um, but it could be anything. I don't even want to guess anymore. Um, and so that was all fine and good, except for the elephant in the room that is Healthy Waltham. Now, Healthy Waltham, uh, if you watch this show, you know that I was the their um, volunteer coordinator for two years. Um, Healthy Waltham has been serving food out of the Fitch uh, for a couple of months now and using the Fitch for storage and occasional pantries for more than a year. And so that was the elephant in the room. And that was what the mayor of Waltham had to account for. Is Healthy Waltham going to stay there? Is the recreation department going to screw that up? What assurances can you give us? And so the mayor uh, decided to... Uh, say that she brought up two city council orders uh, because this has been talked about for a couple of years, uh, two city council orders that said uh, the city council will work with Healthy Waltham to uh, uh, to allow for pantries until they find a permanent home. I'm, uh, that's not the exact quote. Um, and so she said when, when Councillor uh, Bradley MacArthur and Councillor Paz said, what assurances can you give us that Healthy Waltham will stay in place um, while they search for a permanent home? Um, she said, there are two city council orders that suggest this. Now, that is not necessarily 100% the answer those councilors are looking for. That is not 100%. The, uh, the mayor is saying they have until the end of the year. They have until the end of the summer. Uh, they said, well, we agreed that we were going to help them find a home and we're going to stick to that. Uh, so I don't know how binding that is. That would be kind of, I, I, th I think it's ridiculous to suggest that because of that, they can't be kicked out of the, uh, of the Fitch. I think, I think it's entirely possible. I think it would be very easy uh, for the recreation department or the mayor just to say, you're not allowed there anymore. Um, I don't think a uh, city council order from 2021 that says we're going to work with the, with healthy Waltham is going to hold up. We, they could easily say we're going to work with them by giving them another building farther away or something like that. So I don't think that is not, I don't think that was the answer they were looking for. Um, so I don't know if James or Josh, you have um, any thoughts on this, but I'm just going to continue talking. Um, so in that, uh, um, did I get? Oh yeah. So it, it's in the rec department meeting. I think you mentioned like what was what the plan was for the place. And it sounds like demolishing basically the building, keeping a, like a historical mural section and the gymnasium section was not, was the plan. Okay. Say that one more time. Gymnasium and what? Keeping Memorial? the gymnasium and there's like a, uh, I think a mural wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, they saved. They saved several pieces of Waltham history and art uh, in mm -hmm. the building. And so, yeah, I could see them. That'd be kind of cool to include a space for that. And so they just want to just keep it as a gymnasium. So They're keep the gymnasium thank portion you for, of it. Yeah. Thank you for going to that meeting. Okay. Um, two, two anecdotes about Healthy Waltham. Um, in that meeting, the mayor talked about... Uh, how she wants she said she's always been supportive uh of healthy waltham and she wants them to find a permanent home because she finds it undignified that people have to wait in line for hours and hours and hours um i have a couple of things uh to say about that um the first uh as someone that works for healthy waltham and is now able to say whatever i want about that i want to reiterate and i've already done this that uh the biggest obstacle that healthy waltham has to thrive in its fullest potential uh as at combating food insecurity the biggest obstacle is uh probably capitalism the second biggest obstacle is uh jeanette mccarthy um 100 every step of the way it's been her making this difficult um and so she can talk about all she wants about uh finding it undignified that people have to sit in line for hours and hours and hours. At the heyday of Healthy Waltham, we had two lanes for driving, uh, drive up pantry. Um, and we were doing like 950 families. And the mayor came and chopped that off at its knees. Um, 
and eventually we went down to one lane and then we moved to the government center uh and then had to do a thing that was like half a lane and then now uh they they kicked them out of the government center they're at the pitch there's no driving at all and so everyone has to walk the lines are getting longer uh and so for her to suggest that it's undignified for them to have to stand in line my brother in christ you made them stand in the line uh, it's a scheduling thing too like they 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 have them in a government center state like government center they've had them in a space that they controlled like the access to so they could have just allowed them to operate in more than just a specific window of time you know mm-hmm. yeah like they could have had like a, they could have allowed, allowed them to like have access for people collecting stuff throughout the week and done it like mm-hmm. that way but it's the the vision of how they view this and it's that that's what they view this as and that's what it turned out like yes um and she said uh, also in that meeting uh, that the city has always been a uh, vocal uh, supporter of Healthy Waltham and that it cost them nothing to do the pantry. That's just objectively false. And I think I think I think what she was trying to say uh, was that all the things that the city does for Healthy Waltham is for free. And I will get to that in a second. And that's mostly true. Uh, but to say that what they do for is it costs them nothing is, is ridiculous. Uh, is it true that they get all their food donated? Uh, no, uh, most of it, yes, but they, they spend, uh, when I, you know, when I was working there, I didn't work there and I haven't worked there in over a year now. Uh, they were spending over a thousand dollars in like culturally appropriate food because from the greater Boston food bank, you get a lot of staples and stuff. Uh, but I mean, there's, there's so many nuances to giving away food and making people feel comfortable accepting food, uh, and culturally appropriate food was part of that. And so we were spending thousands of dollars on food, every single pantry. We were spending thousands of dollars on supplies. We were spending thousands of dollars uh on logistics there's so many there's so much uh money that goes into these things um it is true 100 percent that uh this is, uh, city of waltham provides a police detail that uh that they've never paid for um that they provide the space itself uh they've never paid for and certain repairs uh, they uh provided as well so i definitely want to be on the record as saying there's plenty of things that um um the city of waltham has done what they haven't done is been hospitable at all. Uh, what they haven't done is worked with Healthy Waltham to the extent that other cities do. In my time there uh, at Healthy Waltham, I went across the state uh, visiting other food pantries, trying to get a vibe for best practices and what they are doing and what we could be doing differently. Let me tell you, uh, there are so many food pantries, so many cities working hand in hand with their food pantries. Um, and it, uh, I mean, just 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 across the way, Newton uh, allowed their food pantry to go into City Hall, and they've basically taken over their basement and allowed them to do renovations, allowed them to hang up signs. They basically own the City Hall basement for free, and uh, it's it's just a much closer relationship. Of course, not perfect. They'll they'll um, you know they have their own uh, problems as well, but uh, they they are not concerned. Uh, about the relationship with the city and healthy wealth and does have to have, be that concern. Um, okay, uh, I can talk about this forever. I'm going to continue though for a little bit. Um, undignified, uh, she used those words. Um, and this is a good segue into my uh, little Patreon. Um, if you didn't watch the last episode, I now have uh, my own Patreon where I uh, where I've been talking a little bit more about, I've been fleshing out the ideas uh, that I talk about on this show and in my life. Uh, And in the most recent post, which you can't view uh, unless you give me some form of uh, currency, um, I talk about 92 Felton Street, um, which uh, the uh, city of Waltham put an RFP out for and uh, Healthy Waltham is considering putting an RFP on that uh, to become their permanent home. I go in on that all of a sudden. But what I wanna point out, undignified. Uh, in 92 Fountain Street in 2019 and 2020, um, it was a warming center that the city of Waltham put on uh, where people could, uh, that people that slept outside, they could come inside uh, to escape the cold. Sounds great. Uh, the problem is 92 Fountain Street was a disaster. It was, uh, it was literally uh, under the Geneva Convention, uh, a label that could be labeled as torturous. It was... Uh, the people, it was not technically a shelter, and I go into that more if you want to learn more, uh, but 
it was not technically a shelter. So they had to keep the lights on. And so people had to just literally just like be in a place all night with the light, with, which is like high beams uh, beaming down on them. The, there were nails across the, in, in the, in the walls. There was concrete flooring that people had to lay on. It was a disaster. Better than nothing. Yes. Torturous, inhumane, awful. Yes. Undignified. Yes. So if this city, uh, if the mayor of Waltham wants to talk about undignified, um, I have some thoughts about uh, undignified as well. Um, and so one final anecdote. I have more to say about this. Um, Kathy Ann Harris um, has been, was actually a big supporter of the Fitch being used for Healthy Waltham um, at that meeting. And that is a change of tune from Kathy Ann Harris. Uh, when this was all talked about first in 2021, uh, about is Healthy Waltham going to be at the Fitch? Are they not? Kathy Ann Harris, she was the biggest opponent of, of them being there. The, the, um, the biggest sticking point, um, and I'll give, give credit where credit is due, is that she was saying that the neighborhood would not be in support of that. She was being a good city councilor. She was being a liaison to her community. And the neighborhood said, no, we don't want a uh, food pantry that attracts hundreds and hundreds of people there. They were concerned about vagrancy. Those were not my words uh, being used. Um, and so uh, there's been a change of tune, um, and she is now in support of that. Uh, I don't, uh, I could guess why uh, that is, but I don't actually know. Um, but I will say, funny anecdote, uh, that online there was a discussion about this, um, about the Fitch, uh, what is it, where it's going to be. And one of the neighbors was like, uh, said, oh, yeah, I'm a neighbor of, of the Fitch and I'm curious, like, what's going to happen? And I just, I just had, I just had an inkling. I was just like, and I, and I asked them, I was like, hey, uh, you know, there's a talk of food pantry and stuff like that. And in 2021, uh, Kathy Ann Harris said that the neighbors uh, were all not in support of the pantry being located at the Fitch. Can you spread some light on that? And she said, I have never heard that. Uh, none of the neighbors that I speak to have ever heard that. I'm in support of that. I would like to see that happen. And so I was like, damn, like how do, where how can you how is it quantifiable how can you prove that uh you're saying you're saying that your constituents um don't want something to happen there's just it just gives you a lot of leeway to say yeah my name the neighbors the neighborhood said that um and so am i saying that it didn't happen no what i am saying is that if there's a neighborhood meeting in your neighborhood please go to these things and make your opinion heard because Old Waltham, uh, the people that want to keep things exactly the same or worse, um, they are going to these meetings and they're making their voices heard. And if a counselor wants, and if, they, if the counselor lines up with those uh, ideologies, they will use that uh, to talk about those things. If it doesn't line up, they won't mention it. But if it does line up, they will use that as evidence that this is what the this is what the neighborhood wants. So you need to go to these meetings and talk about things. What I'm saying, and when I say that, you know, if it doesn't line up with your beliefs, they're not going to do anything. Uh, I'm talking about the master plan committee meetings. Uh, Ninety percent of all of those was talking about pedestrianizing and biking. Very, very little was being done about that. Um, and so, a uh, good example of, you know, if it doesn't line up with what people want, yeah, they're not going to listen. To call back to, to call back to our earlier thing the attendance rights ordinance they want to have a public hearing so that all voices can be heard so they can fixate on the minority that they like oh sure yeah i mean i mean how many how many people were uh not in support of pedestrianizing moody street and talking about bike advocacy it was like such a small 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 amount but those voices are being articulated uh more so than the supporters which was which is overwhelming um and that's because it's all about your agenda what is your agenda and how can you push your agenda um and so i'm sorry i spoke a lot on that um do we have any other thoughts on that before we move on. Oh, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's at the rec center and it's going to be demolished. Um, do I think the healthy all is going to kicked out? Probably not. I think it's going to be fine, but I would like to see some real assurances. 
Um, okay. Uh, I'm very excited about this next piece uh, because Josh is going to enlighten me on uh, some things. Um, but Josh has uh, updates on the Conservation Committee and the Fernald, which uh, I'm stoked about. Please. Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, hold on just a sec. There's some noise upstairs for me. Okay. Yeah, so kind of a surprising turn of events having to do with the plan. As you know, the Recreation Department has a plan in place to put recreational amenities at about a third of the former Fernald site, the former site of the Fernald Developmental Center. Um, and that was recently approved by the Conservation Commission with conditions. Um, and now we learned this week that the city has hired an outside law firm um, to represent the recreation department and they sent on behalf of the recreation department a complaint to the state department of environmental protection um, asking them to overturn the conservation commission's uh, conditions on the grounds that they're onerous and irrelevant um, and I think I don't know for sure but I think this probably came as a big surprise to the conservation commission because I watched the meetings where they discussed these conditions and it was all framed as a back and forth. They said to either the engineer or the um, recreation director, you know, do you think you could do this? Do you think you could do this? And they said yes to everything. And the recreation director seemed not happy about every suggestion, especially the one about not um, using rodent poison on the site, but she didn't say no to it. She didn't say she would need to check with anybody. She seemed to say, she sort of said, okay, as if like she felt like she didn't have a choice. So it seems like maybe what happened was after that meeting, um, the mayor got involved in this and decided to do this. And I, I'd say that because um, I'm gonna share my screen and you can see the, Um, so part of the reason I, I think this, the mayor was behind this is it's because it's kind of her MO. It has sort of a list of grievances about what the um, Conservation Commission was demanding, but they weren't really demanding anything. It was a conversation. There was an opportunity uh, for discussion and, and there was discussion over it. And also because it says things in here like they, um, oh, a uh, uh, project with reasonable conditions and not the many multiple pages of unreasonable conditions. There is a re several references to the conditions taking up multiple pages, which of course is irrelevant because something reasonable can take up a lot of pages and something unreasonable could take up one page. But that's some, a rhetorical uh, thing that the mayor uses quite a bit. And we remember with the farm property, she said she had given the council copious information about it because she had in fact given them 100 pages of information, but it wasn't the information they needed. Um, so it's possible that she got in touch with someone on the Conservation Commission and they put their foot down and that's what prompted this. But I don't think that's what happened. I think that um, this was was kind of a sudden turn to an adversarial approach to this. So the things that she says are unreasonable are the rodent poison. She said that's irrelevant to protecting the wetlands, asking them not to use rodent poison, which is killing raptors. Um, that seems to be make sense if you're completely in denial about the concept of uh, ecology, <laughs> that poisoned rats and poisoned animals in the wetlands could be harming the wetlands. Um, the other things that were kind of odd about it is she said it was unreasonable that they asked the city to put a conservation restriction on the property because that's uh, a requirement of the Community Preservation Act and it's not the Conservation Commission's job to um, uh, enforce that, which is technically correct. But the thing is, the city is required by state law to put restrictions on all the properties purchased with CPC money, and we are out of compliance on most of them. So that's probably why the conservation put this in here sort of as a reminder. So the way a conservation restriction works is a third, the city still owns the land, but a third party manages it and, and is responsible for enforcing the conservation rules. So that could be, for 
example, Wolfham Land Trust, or in other cities, it could be the Audubon Society or the Trustees of Reservations. Um, and so uh, she is saying that they had no business uh, trying to enforce that, which is technically true. But if somebody's asking you if you're going to follow the law, the right answer is yes, right? Not that you don't have any business asking me that. So it's very odd that she would push back on them asking her to follow the law. Um, and in fact, at this week's city council meeting, um, she introduced to, she sent to the city council requests for conservation restrictions on seven properties, which include uh, 240 Beaver Street, the field station property. Um, and uh, she had notes on the e-docket, which said she's working on them for the Fernald and for Zero Prospect Hill. So that seems to be just acknowledging that she's trying to get caught up on this. Why is she trying to get caught up on it? Um, just so that she can make the Conservation Commission look more unreasonable because they, they asked her to do this and she was gonna do it anyways. But the thing is the city bought Fernald 14 years ago. So if she's just working on that now, it definitely has something to do with this complaint in the Conservation Commission. Um, so uh, another thing they objected to was the, the uh, holes, or the Conservation Commission wanted holes in, in the netting to make sure animals should get could get through and the city wants the holes to be a different size. It's a matter of inches that require the graphs to be four inches high. Um, so uh, I tried to get some perspective on this. So I talked to my dad who's been on the Conservation Commission in three different towns in Massachusetts. And he said, it's not unusual for somebody to appeal a Conservation Commission decision to this state body. Um, the next step would be a hearing, which will probably take several months to a schedule, so it will delay the project. And he said, uh, from his point of view, it's very unlikely the state will overturn this. Uh, because basically, the job of the state EPA, they care about water and uh, protecting water. And in this case, the Conservation Commission is actually allowing them to build within the buffer zone near the wetlands. And so for them to, so they, so from the state's point of view, it's going to be like, you're lucky they're allowing you to build at all. And you're coming and saying this is onerous. And he thought that the rat poison restriction is in keeping with things that conservation commissions in other cities have done. Um, so anything that's within 100 feet of the wetlands has to go before the conservation commission. But what they can do within that 100 feet, what they can require is often decided by the city ordinance. Um, Waltham, as far as I know, does not have ordinances specifying what the conservation commission can do. So this claim that they're being unreasonable is just relative to the law, which says protect the wetlands, and they're clearly trying to protect the wetlands. So it doesn't seem like they'll have a good case with that um, city regulator. Um, in some cases, if someone doesn't like that decision, they could then sue the Conservation Commission. And maybe that is the reason they had a law firm send this letter, because they want the Conservation Commission to know that they're thinking of suing. Um, he said, though, that's extremely rare because it's extremely expensive because the city would have to pay for both sides legal fees. And in fact, it's not clear who's defending the Conservation Commission against this complaint. Are they going to be defended by the lawyers and City Hall who, you know, work with the mayor on a daily basis. Um, so this is really disturbing to me because what we've seen um, with the pattern with the mayor on other issues is she doesn't tolerate dissent very well. She doesn't see bodies like the city council or commissions as, you know, places where everybody puts in their ideas and then you synthesize something. It's more like she comes in with something and you're with her or you're against her. And it's important to note here that the Conservation Commission is appointed by the mayor. So with this move, what she's saying basically is she can't tolerate dissent even from a commission that she appointed. And that seems very autocratic to me. I know we've, Chris already <laughs> criticized the mayor quite a bit on this show, so I don't wanna overdo it, but this is not, um, 
This is not a democratic leadership style. Um, you know, so all of these commissions are appointed by the mayor. So what's the point of having them if they all represent her opinion? Well, presumably the people who wrote our city charter thought, well, they'll provide other opinions. They'll be like advisors more like, except that they do have some real power, uh, but they, they saw a need for somebody to be able to push back on the mayor and the mayor's not having it. She changed this from a conversation to an adversarial situation all at once. Um, so I think this is a disturbing example of the mayor's MO. It's It shows that she's determined to make this Fernald recreation thing happening. People who are against it are going to end up standing in front of bulldozers and being dragged off by police. And it's not a good look when disabled people are being dragged off her property by police. I hope the mayor realizes that, but it looks like that's where she wants us to go. The only good news is she may have caused a huge delay with this. So as long as it's delayed, that's sad because it means no one can use the property, but it also means the property is conserved for nature. Any other questions or comments on that? I just wanted to point out that out of those things, the points that were like the issues that they had, like one of them was like the fencing thing i was a, I, think I attended that meeting and that was for like the chipping range specifically so it's like they're doing all of this over like the the like the golf course portion of this or not all of it but like that's like a major point, sticking point is like the golf course portion of this which is just fascinating again yeah, so the, the chipping range is supposed to include a net to catch the balls, and then people who came to the meeting raised the issue of, well, aren't a lot of these golf balls are going to end up in the wetland? So there was a whole bunch of back and forth about the different options for nets and what was what was needed, and I guess they came up with six-inch holes on the bottom of the net for turtles and animals to get through. And I guess someone at the city decided that's not standard. It should be four inches, six inches could be a danger to young children, it said in the complaint. But this is just kind of crazy issue to be bringing before a state regulator over how many issue, how many inches the net should be. To, to go to court over, it really takes a lawyer to want to go to court over two inches of net hole. Yeah, it, this seems like a huge waste of taxpayer money because it's it's the mayor spending money to take, do an adversarial process. And it seems to me, and I don't want to, you know, over assume her intent, but it seems like the intent here is not just to stop them from making this decision, but to make them regret ever questioning her, make them afraid to ever question her again, because they're now in danger of being sued and they don't know who's defending them. If, you know, it's, there's a, a shortage of people willing to be on city boards and this kind of behavior can't help because there's, I know there's a lot of reasons for that. But if I felt like I was getting threatening letters from a lawyer representing the same people who asked me to be on the board and appointed me to the board, I would maybe rep regret serving on that board. Is the interpretation to be that if you are serving on a board appointed by the mayor, that if you don't rule the way that she likes, you are going to potentially have this happen? I actually have a, a great uh, example of something very similar happening in Waltham. Uh, so I wasn't planning on talking about this, uh, but you, were, while you were talking, it reminded me um, that in uh, 2018, uh, in 2017, sorry, there was a group called the Waltham Energy Action Committee, um, which was tasked with uh, uh, finding ways for Waltham to become more energy efficient, um, dealing with a lot of climate stuff. Uh, and uh, during that year, um, the committee publicly resigned, uh, the whole committee dissolved, um, and they sent a letter to the mayor and the press as well, um, saying, uh, I, wanna, I wanna make sure I get this right, um, uh, quote, um, while we are proud to have accomplished many things over the past eight years, we have not been as success successful as we would have liked. We frequently met with resistance and disinterest from the mayor and Waltham employees. During 2017, these very roadblocks became substantial enough that the committee determined that we could no longer proceed. So this is a committee that literally was a municipal committee uh, formed for the city. Uh, to become more energy efficient. These are people taking time out of their day to uh, make the city a better place. And they, throughout the years, were met with so many obstacles and so many uh, times the mayor, the mayor just disagreeing with them and trying to uh, 
to do the opposite, that eventually they just resigned and dissolved. And so I, I don't think the conservation committee is going to do that, um, but it's definitely precedent for the mayor. Uh, just again, just wanting to do things her way, just not really having a, um, it all goes back to planning, really. Um, yeah, I hope that they don't step down. I think the chair of that commission is doing a great job and he actually, it looked like he put a lot of time into these conditions and getting the right wording. That's why it was so many pages. Um, and uh, in the meetings, the reason there was a lot of, part of the reason there was a lot of conditions is so sort of the standard, um, you know, the standard they've had in the past is they don't let people build within 50 feet, but sometimes they'll go down to 25. And then the original plans, there were places where it was much closer to the wetlands. I believe it was as low as eight feet at one point. I'm not certain about that, but it was, it was something very low like that. So the chair of the commission went with the engineer through each part, every place that it was less than 25 feet and said, why does it have to be less here? Why couldn't you do this? So they were having a conversation about the substance of this project and how to make it better. This wasn't an adversarial process. This was like a back and forth, like how, you know, let's get it. So as a result of all those little changes, you know, the, the engineer probably felt like they were being made, asked for a lot. They were being asked to make multiple revisions. Maybe the recreation director was frustrated. It was a lot of work, but it were, it's work that goes directly to preserving the land in the right way. It wasn't, it wasn't stonewalling. It wasn't work that they were just pulling out of nowhere. So um, from the good advice of your father, you think this is going to take months to play out? He said it would take probably a few months to get a hearing. He said the hearing would take 45 minutes. He was very specific in his predictions. He said the hearing would take 45 minutes because the, they would look at it and they would say, wait a minute, so they're letting you build 25 feet from a wetland and you're complaining? Because they'd rather, if from the state's point of view, water is a crisis throughout the state. They'd rather have nobody building within 100 feet if that was feasible, you know? So it's very unlikely... That, so they'll probably throw it out and then we'll see if the uh, the recreation department decides to sue, if the city decides to sue its own conservation commission, which seems like a really expensive and bad move. Over building a golf amenity within 100 feet, within 25 feet of a wetland during a water crisis. Amazing. Yeah. But it was apparently, it, it, all of this seemed very unreasonable to the mayor relative to apparently what the commission's done in the past and what she was expecting from them. Amazing. Um, okay, and finally, uh, something that happened while we were away um, is the Elks Lodge, the future of that was unveiled or talked more about anyway um because it doesn't seem set in stone and so um we talked about this almost a year ago um it, uh the elks lodge was being talked about in executive session and we on this show uh, because i knew that it was eventually going to be unveiled i decided to um ask the uh members what do you think the Elks Lodge is going to become. And so we have that on, on tape. I'd like to show that now. Parking lot. <laughs> got, we can't I got see parking yours, lot. What do you have parking lot? Okay. I got parking lot. And so it was pretty much a unanimous, it's going to become parking. Uh, it's going to become a parking lot, a parking lot. Uh, and uh, let's roll the clip on what it's going to become. Think about definitely for municipal parking. And for the reference. It shows a parking lot. Um, and so it's a parking lot. Um, and so now that I've gotten that out of my system saying that we were right, um, I would like to say also that the mayor does go on to say that the building itself, they're gonna, the parking lot will become a municipal parking lot that people have to pay for. The building itself, she is looking at creating transitional housing. Um, transitional housing is for people that uh, you know, are being pushed out of their home uh, because they can't afford the rent um, and other related crises. Um, there's a few of these in Waltham. Uh, 
Hurley House being one of them. Um, and so if that is possible, uh, that'd be cool. I would like to see that happen. Uh, you know, it's actually, you know, you could build way more housing on that than the four or five units that that would uh, suggest, but it's better than more parking. Um, so I'm interested, you know, I, we'll see if it actually does become that transitional housing or if it becomes parking or if it becomes just a place to store uh, furniture um, between office buildings. Yeah, it's going to be like overflow parking for the municipal lots and for like city vehicles, I guess, but they're going to keep the lot the same size and the Elks building the same size and use it for housing. Yeah, I mean, it's also literally next door to Government Center, which is a municipal parking lot. And so they, they're putting a parking lot in front of a parking lot. And I think that when George Darcy had asked about turning the, the parking lot area into more of like a park or like a backyard for the building, uh, the mayor had pointed out that there's a small tuft of grass on the other side of the building. <laughs> we should also include a picture of that. Hilarious. Um, so I just wanted to go on the record as saying we were right, and, uh, and I'm happy about that. Um, okay, if there's nothing else, we're going to call this a day. I again apologize for the month I ate us. There's all these things that could be talked about, but I don't want to cram them into uh, longer than an hour here. So those things will just be forgotten about forever. Um, and I think we're going to be on next week, uh, but who can say anymore? Um, but thank you all for listening. Thanks for watching. And we will see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.